Let's talk about the dot product, one of the most amazing inventions in applied mathematics. The dot product, I still maintain that it's a combination that doesn't make much intuitive sense. It is a combination that doesn't represent any physical or geometric quantity. On the other hand, paradoxically, it appears from experience that every fact, every idea in geometry can be expressed in terms of the inner product. And that's what makes it so powerful. It's the primary tool for carrying over geometric ideas into algebra. And conversely, for being able to apply algebra to geometric and physical problems. We will try to do, try is not the right word. You will find that so very many things find their expression in terms of the dot product. That really makes it a unique and magical combination. And all of you, I'm sure, already know the definition of the dot product. The problem is that each one of you probably knows three definitions of the dot product. You will know three. So my task right now is to describe the context as carefully as I can. It's the context that's important here because all of you are familiar with the definition of the dot product and like I mentioned, three definitions of the dot product. So my task right now is to make you forget about two out of the three definitions. The object of our study is vectors. A vector is a directed segment. A directed segment, as a geometric object, has a length. When you have a pair of vectors, the, they form an angle. We have these concepts at our disposal. It is perfectly valid for us to use the concepts of length and angles to make whatever definitions we want. The object of our study is a geometric object. With it naturally come certain concepts. Length and angle are certainly those concepts. So it's okay to use them. And so the definition of the dot product between two vectors, A and B, is the product of their lengths times the cosine of the angle between them. That's the definition. That's the definition. If you're a physicist, you may be familiar with this as the, defini as the definition of the dot product. If you're a math major, you may think of it as an example of an inner product in linear algebra. I'll say more about this in just a moment. First, let's experience this definition a little bit. Because like I said, it doesn't make too much intuitive sense. This quantity, this number, does not on its own, out of context, represent anything physical. It uses physical elements in it. We know what the length represents. It's the length of the vector A. Same for the length of the vector B. We know what the angle represents. If we had a protractor, we could measure this angle. That's a very, each one of those are very intuitive physical quantities. This combination is out of the blue. I never would have thought of it in a million years. I don't think any particular person ever thought of it. It's just that it slowly, over centuries, dawned on people that this is a very, very convenient combination because it just keeps popping up. You keep doing these different things in geometry and physics, and this combination just keeps popping up. So let's just call it something, the dot product, and now it's a thing. So let's experience it a little bit. Let me ask you the following question. Vectors, geometric vectors are geometric objects. We can talk about angles between two vectors. So I can ask you, what if A and B are orthogonal? Perfectly valid question for geometric vectors. Here is A, here is B. What if they are orthogonal? According to this definition, what is A dot B? If A is orthogonal to B, from this it follows that A dot B equals zero, very good. What if A and B are the same vector? 
If a and b are the same vector, a and a, then the angle gamma between the two vectors is zero, its cosine is one, and so what we have is length squared. The length squared. Okay, so I think it's slowly beginning to show its utility. For instance, and I just want you to be aware of the fact that this is circuitous, that's the right word. One could say that you could test whether A and B are orthogonal by finding their dot product. And you will say to me, that's total nonsense. Because in order to evaluate the dot product, I have to find the angle between A and B. And if I know that the angle is 90 degrees, I don't have to calculate the dot product to figure out that they're orthogonal. And if you said that, you, were, you would be absolutely right. But it doesn't change the fact that orthogonality can now be expressed algebraically. That's the real benefit. Yes? You, because with algebra comes algebra. With algebra come all of the tremendous benefits of algebra. You can manipulate expressions according to the rules of algebra. And these will, of course, follow many of the rules of algebra. And then algebra will provide the answer. So it's a tremendous it's a tremendous advantage. I'm not saying that, yes, in order to figure out, I don't, <laughs> I don't believe you. I'm not advocating that you calculate the dot product to figure out whether two vectors are orthogonal. That's, in this context, nonsense. But we are going a long way towards algebraizing what's going on, and that's our goal, converting geometry to algebra. And I think you're beginning to see it happen. Okay, so I will now do something wrong as a way of making a very important point. I will now prove the law of cosines by using the dot product. And there will be a deep flaw in that proof, and you'll tell me what that flaw is. So the proof is very simple. I will draw a triangle, I will put my arbitrary origin that we've been talking about right at one of the vertices, just because I want to make a quick point, and then we'll see what happens. So I'll call it C, C starting from here, so this is my vector C, and I will now write that C equals A minus B, and I will dot both sides of the equation with itself. And we'll see what happens. No objections, right? That means that C dotted with itself equals A minus B dotted with itself. If two vectors are equal, then this one dotted with itself equals this one dotted with itself. So, what will happen when we Multiply this out. So, well, on the left we have C dotted with itself. I will use the following notation. The letter A without the arrow is the length of the vector A, because I don't want to write length too much. And the same for C and the same for, the same for B and the same for C. So then this C dotted with C is the length of C squared. Let's see what we'll have on the right. A dotted with A, that's the length of A squared. Then there will also be minus B dotted with minus B. That will be the length of B squared. Then there will be A dotted with B, minus A dotted with B, and minus B dotted with A. Now, are those the same thing? A dotted with B and B dotted with A is the dot product symmetric? Yes, it is symmetric. Let me start documenting its properties. Because both would be length of one times the length of the other times the cosine of the angle between them. And you might want to be a little bit careful because maybe the angle has sine. When you go from A to B, maybe it's 30 degrees. 
But, when you, but then when you go from B to A, maybe you should count it as minus 30 degrees. So maybe our angles have a sine convention. But when we take the cosine, co the cosine is an even function, it doesn't matter whether it's plus 30 degrees or minus 30 degrees. So even if you add the, angle, the sine convention to the angle, the cosine eats it. So yes, this is absolutely true. So we can write minus 2A a dotted with B, which is the length of A, times the length of B, times the cosine of the angle between them. And this is the celebrated law of cosines. And we just proved it out of nothing. Recall, this is a very sophisticated theorem in geometry. Yet, I just proved it on the back of an envelope. What's the deal with that? Is this clean or did I make or did I cheat a little bit? How is it possible that I just gave a definition, figured out one property, and then boom, an amazing theorem in geometry, you get pretty much for free. Exactly right. We did not prove distributivity. We used distributivity, we used commutativity, but we proved it. But first and foremost, we used distributivity. And who, who told us that this satisfies the distributive property? In fact, as I did before with associativity, let me plant a seed of doubt. So the distributive property will look like this. Okay, and once you have this, you can multiply it out when it's a sum, when it's sum times a sum. So from here to there is not a big leap, but where does this come from? Yes. So where does, okay, so let me make you doubt that this is even true. And then maybe we'll have just enough time today to prove this. But this, here's what this would mean. Here is our vector, I'll stick with black. Here is our vector A. Here is our vector B. Here's our vector C. Then here's our vector B plus C. B plus C. So what this is saying is that when we dot A with B plus C, in other words, the length of A times the length of B plus C times the cosine of the angle between them equals the length of A times the length of B times the cosine of the angle between them plus the length of A times the length of C times the cosine of the angle between them. That's a mess. Right, do you see that it's not at all obvious? I just interpreted what this would mean. The length of A times the length of B plus C times the cosine of the angle between them Okay, equals the length of A times the length of B, the length of A times the length of B, times the cosine of this angle, plus the length of A times the length of C, times the cosine of the angle between them. So not at all obvious. So until we prove this, this proof is completely invalid, because we use the distributive property, which we haven't yet established. And maybe the proof of the distributive property requires the law of cosines, in which case that's not a valid proof at all. So we have to be careful. Let's prove the distributive property. Well, since we're at it, let's prove the distributive property. So just like with associativity, remember, if once we redrew the picture in terms of tip to tail, it kind of became obvious. So if here, if we look at it just the right way, then you will see that this is actually not all that sophisticated. So here it is. Let's talk about A dot B first. The length of A times the length of B, so I'll write it like this, shorthand for length. This is the length of A, this is the length of B, this is the cosine of the angle between them. And I will group these two terms together 
And for this one, I will find a geometric interpretation. Because here is the angle gamma between A and B. So B cosine gamma from this right triangle is this segment right here. Now, let's approach A dot C the same way. A dot C is the length of A times the length of C times the cosine of the angle between them. We'll call that epsilon. Let's once again concentrate on this portion right here because that does have a geometric interpretation of its own. And of course, from this right triangle, it's this length right here. Okay, so A dot B plus A dot C, we can factor out the length of A, and in parentheses, we'll have this length plus this length. Are you beginning to see how everything will work out just right? Because here is B plus C. And what is A dotted with B plus C? Well, it's the length of A times here, there is no avoiding writing length of B plus C. It's once again the same length of A, and I will once again just concentrate on what this represents geometrically. It's the length of B plus C, complete the right triangle. In other words, find the projection, and we end up with this length right here. And so when we're testing the distributive law, you will notice that the length of A gets factored out on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side, we just have this length in parentheses. Not in parentheses, because th there's no sum. And on the right, we have this length plus this, excuse me, this length plus this length. And the question is, is this length the length of the projection of C plus the length of the projection of B equal the length of the projection of B plus C. And there it's apparent that that relationship holds because this line right here is in the parallelogram with this line. So it's the same direction and the same length. So its projection right here is the same as C cosine epsilon. You see, it's the same triangle here and here. So this length equals this length. So indeed, this length plus this length equals this length. It's clear in this projection sense. And so the distributive law is proven. And maybe once we've established the distributive law, and I do not believe I used the law of cosines to do this. It was just elementary trigonometry and right triangles. We can now consider that super short proof of the law of cosines complete. And so that's a very, maybe your first very nice application of the dot product.